millennia has passed since the Twilight Wars. A quiet stillness has taken hold in the galaxy in the absence of conflict, and over time the great races have recovered a portion of their former strength. Some, no longer content to remain within the bounds of their reduced territories, have begun to look beyond the stars of their home systems. Nestled in the third orbit of the Sol system lies Yord, the ancestral home of the human race. The following is an account of the Federation of Sol's struggles and triumphs during this new era of conflict. A new empire was coming, to be ruled again from the ancient throne on Mechatol Rex. How was the Federation of Sol to fit into this new empire? High Minister Juan Salvador Tao had dedicated himself to making sure his federation will prevail during the upcoming power struggle and inevitable war. Part 1 The first two years of Minister Tao's administration. Minister Tao would set the Federation's first priority to regaining control of some of its most valuable colonies. First, an army asset was sent to Joel I.R. On this heavily industrialized world, pollution has killed all life outside of known cities. But twin suns provide constant power for factories and a huge population. Federation forces were able to discover and secure several abandoned warehouses on Joel. It looked as though some smugglers had abandoned operations here a long time ago. The commodities gain, though common in the Federation, would be valuable for trade in the future. During this time, two armies were landed on Echoen. The population of this world live on continent-sized fungal rafts that float atop a soupy, world-spanning ocean of useful biocompounds a popular research site for biologists. Since being lost to the Federation, the people of this world had constructed a massive cybernetics research facility in its capital. The facility would prove to be a great asset to the Federation in the coming years. Lerta 4, another valuable planet, was next on the agenda. Lerta 4 is covered in vast swamps and fetid bogs home to rare biological compounds unique to its marshland used in everything from exotic foods to biogenetic drugs. Minister Tao knew that the difficult terrain on this world would make exploration difficult. With the Ministry of Industries backing, 150,000 Federation troops would be reassigned to help explore the planet and set up new infrastructure. It was seen as a worthwhile use of the Army's time to get the planet producing for the Federation as soon as possible. It was decided at this time that while the short-term plans were moving along nicely, there needed to be discussion of long-term goals. Believing that war was inevitable, it was decided that when war came, the Federation would be unrelenting, not stopping until their opponent was utterly dominated. This was a controversial edict, as many worried it would blind the Federation to more practical, peaceful solutions to future conflicts. There was a celebration back on Yod as the cruiser Amsterdam had just finished its construction. It was the first warship in decades constructed by the Federation. It would turn out to be the first of many new instruments of war created by humans. Meanwhile, debates about the direction of research and development were raging in New Moscow. Minister Tao's vision for the future of the fleet was one of state-of-the-art ships brimming with advanced technology. A powerful AI development algorithm was developed that would help Tao's vision come true. The Federation's plan of rapid expansion was coming together well. It was decided that the army currently on Alerta 4 needed to be moved to Bereg at once. Around this time, a decision was made to divert logistical resources from the fleet to other areas. It was reason that there would not be a need to maintain large war fleets until other factions were encountered amongst the stars. Bereg was recolonized without incident, a frozen world that is inhospitable to most races. Indentured laborers risk attacks from Arctic Shareks in the infamous Lodinium mines. 
It was in one of these mines that the Federation discovered a strange artifact. It was clearly a piece of some ancient technological wonder, but the Federation scientists weren't able to make heads or tails of the discovery. For now, the relic fragment would be sent back to Yod for safekeeping. At this time, the measure of success for all the factions was what one might expect. Who could explore the reaches of space first? Who could expand their territory the fastest? Major factions carefully kept an eye on their rivals' progress as time passed. Frightening for most, the necrovirus was clearly ahead when it came to exploration. Part 2. Years 3 and 4 of the Tau Administration. There were many strong opinions among the Federation leaders as to how to proceed next. These years would be marked by fierce political campaigns and power struggles within the Federation. Changes were happening in New Moscow, and the government would have to start making some real decisions on who the Federation would be in these coming years. A point of contention was what to do about Archon Vale. Its location made it strategically important to the security of the Federation. The Nomad, however, was very vocal about their intent to claim the world for themselves. Was it worth angering a powerful neighbor? Many felt that from a diplomatic standpoint, it was better to preserve the peace. Many believed at this time the Federation's goal was obvious, reach Mechatol Rex before anyone else. As factions expanded their territories, it was clear that room to breathe was running out. How long could the galaxy continue to be without war? The Federation feared that war might come soon as their borders grew close to the Sardak Nor. Having decided that making a move on Mechatol Rex was the best course of action, the Federation took control of the planet Abyss. Its thick, complex atmosphere is inhospitable to most races, but Abyss is known for its seemingly endless natural reserves of rare minerals and precious metals. The successful use of the military to aid civilian exploration and construction on Lurda IV by this time was apparent. The Federation would do the same here. 150,000 personnel from the army would help get the planet ready for operations in as expedient manner as possible. As promised, the Nomad took control of Archon Vale. A notable threat was now at the Federation's doorstep. With the world being in striking distance of three Federation systems, it was clear that diplomats would have to be dispatched immediately. As if the Federation didn't have enough to worry about, the Sardak Nor were on the border opposite the Nomad, poised to strike also at multiple Federation systems. An emergency order was put out by Minister Tao for the rapid deployment of 300,000 troops to reinforce Akowin in case of an invasion. Meanwhile, the Nomad had begun construction of two massive planetary defense systems on the border. The Federation had spread itself very thin in its effort not to fall behind the other faction's colonization efforts. It was clear now they had left themselves dangerously open to attack. Further complicating things for the Federation was the neglect and mismanagement of logistical resources during the expansion. Even if they could construct a defensive fleet fast enough, would they be able to mobilize such a fleet in time? Commander Claire Gibson was put in charge of all Federation ground assets in order to prepare a defense against planetary invasions. Fortunately for the Federation, the Nomad had no interest in war with humans. Negotiations over a non-aggression agreement had started being drawn up. 
The Nomad, pleased that the Federation had willingly ceded control of Archon Vale, agreed to a trade agreement that would also include a treaty. While the deal was economically very much in favor of the Nomad, the promise of peace, if temporary, made it a valuable exchange for the Federation. A production drive was put in place to increase defensive capabilities. Several military assets were constructed, including the SS Genesis, a new class of warship designed to carry an unheard of quantity of troops and fighters into battle. Surely the Federation's new flagship would cause pause for anyone who had been thinking of taking aggressive actions against Federation colonies. The Ministry of Industry passes a measure to invest heavily in manufacturing technology. Sarwing tools are developed and incorporated into Federation shipyards. The long-term effect on construction will be significant. Despite a very heated and divisive election year back on Yod, the Federation of Souls politicians are able to work together to pass some of the most effective legislation in years. Their most notable accomplishment is successfully lobbying other factions in the galaxy into rejecting a growing anti-intellectual revolution that had been gaining some steam. Next on the agenda was to invest in and reorganize the military's failing logistic policies. Through lobbying and investment, Minister Tao was able to significantly strengthen the Federation's ability to smoothly conduct operations going forward. As factions begin meeting each other in space and setting up official boundaries, many begin thinking about commerce. The quality of a faction's trade routes become a marker of that faction's success in the galaxy. In the upcoming years, the Federation of Seoul would focus its efforts heavily on research and development. Almost all in the government agreed that it was time to make Tao's vision of a technologically superior fleet a reality. Expansion was slowing in the galaxy as real estate was becoming tight. Every faction had met their neighbors and the Federation of Seoul was in range of Mechatol Rex. Flanked by rival fleets and squeezed by planetary defense systems, the Federation had to make a tough decision whether to press on to Mechatol Rex or consolidate its forces at this time. 